So for the children's message, you'll stay in your pews today, so it's, it's for all of us. So for all of our kids and for everyone gathered here today, we're looking at Jesus as the cornerstone. So I wanted to show our kids and for everyone some cornerstones that we have at Doolin Church. So we're going to put the first one on the screen. And that one's hard to see, but that one is funny. It's in a funny location. This is at the top uh, near the roof line. And I looked in the Presbyterian Church. They have theirs in the same location. So it must have been back in the uh, post-Civil War that uh, churches and all types of buildings had their cornerstones at the top. So this one says Doolin uh, Methodist Church, and then it has uh, May 30, 1869. So Doolin Church has got some age on it, and so it's 150, coming up 154 years. So that is one cornerstone that we have. And then we have a second cornerstone, if we can pull that one up, that's easier to read. Annex to Doolin Church, that was September 9th, 1950. And so that's kind of the part of the building um, back here. So that's the second one that we have. And then we have a third one, which is more of like the cornerstones that we see in buildings today, where it's at the bottom and it takes two sides, which means that the building is standing on this cornerstone. If we took that cornerstone away, the building might fall down. So we have 1979 is when this part of the building was put together, was built. So cornerstones are very important. You see them all over the place. But at Doolin Church, how many do we have? One, two, everybody? Three, we have three. So we wanna make sure to get it right. So we're glad everybody's here today and we'll pray and we'll have Pastor Dave to pray and you'll pray with me, all right? So let's try it together, ready? Dear God, we thank you for Jesus, who is our cornerstone. Amen. All right, so thanks for being here today. We'll see you next week. All right, very good. Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Let us pray. Speak to us, living God, as you have spoken to our ancestors through the voice of your prophets, the breath of your spirit, and the life of your Son, so that we may live according to your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The epistle lesson this morning is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by, if you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe he is precious, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you in out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. For now on you do know him and have seen him. Father said, excuse me, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Chad. <clears throat> I was thinking of passing out stones today to everybody, but I was afraid you would stone me, so I didn't do that. Who is the martyr? It's the epistle for today. We didn't use that lection, but who is the first Christian martyr? Stephen. Stephen is his name. So um, I had Stephen on my mind this week. Living stones, cornerstone. We hear of stories about places finding a cornerstone, opening them up to see what would happen. I can recall in Richmond, Virginia, when they were taking down the Confederate monuments, and for each monument they dug and dug and dug to see what kind of um, uh, things would have been tucked underneath or what was the cornerstone there, the significance of those particular monuments newspaper clippings, pictures, letters. We often think of cornerstones as ceremonial or representative markers. Banks, churches, courthouses, museums. Many buildings have engraved stones that marks the name of the edifice and the date of its construction. The cornerstone is most often the large stone that is selected for its strength and placed in the foundation of a wall angle to bind the walls together. At times, there's a capstone, like we see at the Washington Monument when it was completed. So I was doing some research about the Washington Monument, and it was com- it was started, the cornerstone was July 4th, 1848. And when completed in 1876, it was the tallest building in the world. I had no clue. It was the tallest building in the world at 555 feet. So anybody have a clue which building the Washington Monument eclipsed. It was the cathedral at Köln, Germany. Uh, And if you see that picture, the spire is just tremendous. If you look at that cathedral, the spire just seems to go for on and on and on, and it was 515 feet. Which building eclipsed the Washington Monument? The Washington Monument's 555 feet. Anyone know which building eclipsed the Washington Monument? Nope. Polyvu Francais? Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. A thousand feet. But what's interesting is with the Washington Monument, the reason I bring it up, 
It has the cornerstone, but also it has a capstone at the very, very top. And it says, Laos Dei. Praise be to God. This Washington Monument to build this edifice, it was a big deal. I thought it was only two types of stone to build it, but it was three. And you can see the different layers of it. We've heard about the experience with the earthquake. Remember that? And they had to kind of fix it up and the elevator's all a mess. The Washington Monument. Praise be to God. In our scripture today, Peter writes of Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of the Christian faith. But for Peter, the risen Lord is far more than a decorative or ceremonial marker. Only when Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church, the most basic element of our community of faith, do we become that dwelling place for God. So what does it mean for Christ, for Jesus, to be the cornerstone of the church? That's what 1 Peter tells us today. Jesus constructed his ministry from the bricks of acceptance of outcasts and the mortar of an open table fellowship. He built a house that would last beyond his death and would become his place of worship upon his resurrection. And today we have thousands and thousands and thousands of churches built to proclaim Christ is risen. Christ will come again. The cornerstone, it is what holds the church together. And in the early church, there was division between the Jews and the non-Jews that we call Gentiles. And it was Paul who came along that had to say the Gentiles are welcome to be disciples of Jesus Christ as well. These early Christians, they were used to the way that the synagogue in, in Jerusalem was like, where there was a division between men and women, between Jews and non-Jews. Blocks of stone created separation. And yet it is Christ who calls all of us to love God and to love our neighbor. No one is excluded. No one are second-class citizens. So many times we put conditions on those who are welcomed, on those who are accepted into the life of the church. Unfortunately, in our Christian history, in our church in America... We know that there has been division in the church. People with their own agendas and judgments rather than that of Jesus Christ to love God and to love neighbor as thyself. 19th century slavery of African Americans. The exclusion of the role of women in the 20th century. In the 21st century, the role of LGBTQIA has come into focus with same-sex marriage and is creating division in the life of the church and right now in the United Methodist Church. Yesterday, I had a Zoom call with all of the clergy and, the la- and some of the laity in Virginia conference. And we voted that 64 churches to disaffiliate because disagreements over same-sex marriage in the life of the church. In Virginia, this was our second vote. Now it's up to about 103 churches that have left uh, our Virginia conference. Our Virginia conference has about 1,150 churches but still 10%. And what was sad for me was in that conference, they named each church quickly, showed a little picture, and then we voted. And I thought, my gosh, was there any fault? Was there any silence? Was there any prayer?
people just wanted to take that vote and get out. And it was done. And I just sat in my office chair here in silence. The bishop that led this event, in the end, he offered a prayer. And he wept. To see our church, you look at Texas, nearly half the churches in Texas, United Methodists, have left. North Carolina is hollowed out. The South is gone. But many remain, and we carry on. But what a predicament we are in. And for all of us, especially as pastors like me, who have given our life to the church, to see it just split apart. But we look at Christ as our cornerstone. And with Christ and we as living stones, we continue the ministry of the church. And I give thanks for Doolin Church and disciples of Doolin Church that we continue to move forward where there are no second-class citizens, where all are included as we strive to be disciples of Jesus Christ. So, back to the sermon here. Imagine Peter. Peter's writing this letter. He's sitting at his desk, and he's probably looking out of a little window, and all that he sees around him are stones, because when you go to Israel or the Holy Land, all you see are stones. And he thinks to himself, imagine... If all these stones here could be living witnesses of Jesus. And then he comes up with the concept that Jesus is the cornerstone of our life. And we are all living stones. And all the stones are needed together to form what we call the church. Come to Christ, a living stone. And then it's interesting that he talks about stumbling blocks, stumbling rocks. And I was thinking this week about how we can get caught up in being stumbling blocks in the life of the church. And I have four, really three. The first is generational. When we have churches that have members that have been for a long time, and we have those folks here. And these persons have the choice to be a stumbling block that we're not able to move forward. Or they can say, yes, I understand the need to move forward. And let me tell you my story at Doolin Church. I can remember when we were doing the building renovation here, and it was quite a change, and it got out among some people. And I had a phone call one day, and this woman, she was just very, very concerned what we were doing to her church. And she went on and on and on and on, and I said, well, help me with your name. And then I said, are you a member here? She said, no. I said, do you worship here? She said, no. I said, well, are you a member? Do you do anything here? She said, no. I wanted to say, well, why in the heck are you calling me? And I got to know this person. And uh, I did her funeral. Through my conversation with her, she became less of a stumbling block and acceptance. Another one is what I call confrontational. I'll be back once you're gone. 
We've had that where some people get upset, they leave until something else happens. And I've learned the need for reconciliation, conversation, and love. And I've learned the hard way that when we can humble ourselves to have conversation, it goes a long way of reconciling one another. The third is what I call recreational. When I have time, I'll go to church. And it's interesting that as we have moved out of COVID, I have seen the routine of families of almost back to normal, if not more action-packed in their days. For me, growing up on Saturday, where you kind of did the fun things in the family time, that Saturday has become Sunday today. People have stuff to do. But the amazing part is that we are able to live stream 24-7 for everyone here. And I get an email or a phone call or a conversation of a Doolin disciple who was not here on Sunday morning, but was able to worship with us live streaming 24-7 from Sunday to the next Sunday. And that's a big deal. The question may be, where is everybody today? They're not just here, but they're at home worshiping or later in the week. And the fourth I have is the need for prayer, the importance of prayer. Prayer is what holds us together as a community of faith. Prayer is what keeps us going as we pray for unity in the life of the church. And it doesn't happen tomorrow or the next day, but it's constant prayer unceasingly. The Jews are still praying for the Messiah to come. And that's been thousands of years. So we pray and we pray and we pray for God's intervention in our lives and in our church. We're called to be living stones. So as we leave this place today, we see a room with many stones, with many bricks, and all of these bricks and stones hold this building together. It's interesting, from the little Doolin church that was built in 1869, it went from that wall to about right here, and that was it. And the only original bricks are this part right here, and I'm going to bring them in a couple of weeks, and they're so lightweight, I'm just waiting for that to come crashing down any day. Because those bricks were made outside. They didn't have a kiln like we know. They were made right outside. They were probably dried in the sun. And I've got some of those bricks, and you'll see how light they are. But those bricks, these stones, hold this church together. And as living stones, we go out into the world being witnesses of Jesus Christ in our lives. I want to close with what I love is the last part of the scripture for today from 1 Peter. It says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. My friends, let us be living stones to go out into the world, to witness, to use our hands and feet, deeds and actions, to let others know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ with Christ as the cornerstone of our life. And this we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we all say together, Amen.